fun. Good me. Yeah, good it was a good. Uh, we took it pretty fast, eh? Did you see at the end? I was downshifting, taking a curve, and then back out. I was like, hey, ah, well, let's enjoy this thing. I am actually very surprised that it picks up speed quickly, and it goes to speed, and it stays there, and. I'm following you with the GTR, <laughs> just in comfort. I'm like, oh, he's going, he's going. Yeah. I better go, and I'm flooring it. And then the GTR is like, oh, I need to go. By the time I pick up, you're like, oh, God. It's feel, that car has got so much to give. Like, it's a three liter inline six, uh, direct fuel injection, 1956, <laughs> 300 SL going. And the thing has got so much power. And it's funny because my uh, DB6, it's a 1969, it's brought up the Vantage Specs, 325 horsepower. And it doesn't have the same power inside the, they're both six cylinders. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's a different, I mean, this car's lighter. It, it's a different aluminum hood, aluminum doors, aluminum trunk. The car, that car's entirely aluminum. But it's a four seater, right? Five seater yeah, versus yeah, yeah. a two seater. So there, it makes a big difference in there. But it's the most comfortable car. I've driven it back and forth to Montreal. So comfortable. I've driven it back at midnight, at moonlight. Just yeah. look at the moonlight. Just enjoying it's everything. So beautiful, man. So beautiful. So, yeah, if you ask me, you know, what car I will never sell, that is the one car I will go to the grave with. Maybe my coffin will be dragged behind it <laughs> in a little, little chariot. Soak it up. And Somebody, yeah, I just want to soak up the smell. Uh, yeah, it's a special oh, car. That's nice. Something I want to talk about because you know we are chatting all day about different things is the fact that when you decided to go into you always loved cars, then you decided to go into buying cars. And one of the things you told me earlier on today was I want to change how cars are being bought and sold. Because you looked at how the industry was run at a higher level and you're like, that's that's not pleasant, that's not nice. And uh, it, it, it's not anymore about people that just love cars and want to share their passion for cars. It's something else. So tell me a bit about your approach to that world. Yeah, I'll tell you a couple things. So yeah, so about 15 years ago, I bought a 190 SL from, a, from an individual guy in Vancouver who was an airline pilot. And we kind of became friends over the car. And I'd call him, I said, you know, I don't know where to buy this. And he would tell me where to buy it. He would come, he flew in from Vancouver like six, seven years later. We became friends, we met. I didn't even have a car back after that. Anyway, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I'm making friends. And I bought a, a Ferrari Dino uh, 246 Chairs and Flares car, which is beautiful, silver on red car. And I bought it from a periodontist of all people who connected, you know, through our own profession. And we became friends. And it was an amazing transaction. It was. Came from, friend, a, from a car lover to another, to another car, car lover, lover and, like and then it was never anything story. about money or anything like that. So that was great. And then I started having a, you know, once you start, the industry changed, right? And as the car auctions came on site, as, as the car values increased, the business got dirty and dirtier because a broker could start making money off of somebody else's car without, without doing anything, right? Just two phone calls, they're making 10%. Then that started getting really dirty and then people lying about VIN numbers and lying about history and I put a deposit on a 904 Porsche that was completely fake. Your plastic cars are 904s, 906s are fiberglass so you can refabricate. And it got really, really, really dirty and I, I really had a few very bad experiences. I've now recently told you about my experience with storing my Lamborghini which was a horrible experience. Um, dealing with some of the factory stuff, you know, even, even with, with other car companies. And so I realized, you know, people who really are passionate about cars, the, the whole passion dies when you have a very bad experience in the buying and selling component. And if there was a way to transact where it was go from one car lover to another car lover, and I think that's where Bring a Trailer has kind of really changed things along, is where there's, we've created a community where people can comment on the cars, people could see stuff on the cars, and the entire world is vetting the car if it's not good or not. And, and yes, there's some dealers on that as well. Um, but if, you know, my original thought was I'm going to get involved in buying and selling and I want to be the most honest, straight guy, represent the best of the best. And there are guys like, you know, the Fiskins of the world in, in the UK, Max Gerardo, there's some really good car guys that do that. But because car values have gone up, now you see the middleman and the middleman has made it dirty. So that's something I've always wanted to change. 
and sadly that's not something we can really change. No matter how hard we try, there will always be yeah you know, the, the side that, that's the dirty side of the business, you know. It, it is, except for you know you can be an honest person, you can do your research, and one of the things that we, we talked about is a developing research team because we have I have the car expert for Porsche who has access to the actual archives at the factory. I have access to the Ferrari factory archives. And when you hire these level of people yeah. that can do in-depth research, then it becomes on you to do the research. But I've created in the last 15 years the expertise I need to get me where I need to go because there's so much stuff that, that I don't know anymore about that you need to know, right? The, the more you learn about cars, the more you realize you know nothing. You know what I like about cars is the history, mm -hmm. you know, the most. So that, that's the stories around the amazing things that have happened and motivated people to make cars. You know, how Lotus Esprit ended up in a movie, how Ford decided to beat Ferrari, how Lamborghini decided to make a car. All those, you know, part of history for me are important. You know, that's what makes the car world what it is. It's not just a piece of metal that goes fast. Yes, it can be that too. And yes, some of them are amazing just for that. Some of the cars, they were built just to go fast. Their goal was to break world record. And, but as a story, again, you know, it's not just a car for a car. Uh, you look at the McLaren, for me, the best way I describe them is liquid engineering. The guy, when you look at the McLaren, for me, it shows that it was done not by a computer, but almost, you know. Every line is trying to be optimized. You look more at a Ferrari or Lamborghini and they're more artistic about it. Mm -hmm. Whereas McLaren's like, what's the, the best line we can have? You know, and they look for that. And different car makers have different stories. It's yeah. like Lotus. The lighter it is, the better it is. Yeah. The, the, that's the mentality. So The other thing that's changing in the car industry, if you look at what's happened is as, as Ferrari became a public company and as it became driven towards profit, there's less being invested in pure design. And in the old days, it was, you know, we want to go race, we want to win races. So the race inspired cars that transformed back into the streetcar, if you look at the 50s and 60s, even in the American cars, the chrome, they look like space shuttles. It, it was unbelievable. It, the creativity, it's almost like there was no engineering. It was all just artistic. And then they made the engineering work afterwards. And so what's happened today, and that's why I think, by the way, the cars of those eras in the 50s and 60s, although, you know, as the baby boomers change, it'll be a different era. But the 50s and 60s are a very unique period where it was complete creativity, and it was there was no requirement of bumper specification, crash testing, and all that. So you know, no, no, none of that was existing. So it didn't matter if you die; you just got to look good. You crash, you die. Ah, that's part of the deal. <laughs> part of the deal. So those cars will always have a very, very unique place in the art world. If yeah. you like it, and that's why I call it rolling art, and that's where I invest in cars, as I, as people do in paintings. And as you know better than I do, being in the art world, uh, I think recently there was a painting that sold for eighty something million. And there's been painting that sold for 150 million. And people said, you know, well, well cars are, are never gonna reach that. But the theory is that the cars will reach what um, painting and art have reached already. We're just behind as people realize that these are actual pieces of art. Yeah, yeah, and that's, I can see that happening slowly over time and you look at a lot of different cars and I think the difference for cars is that there is the artistic side but there is also the engineering side. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the F40, that was a revolution of engineering when they put it to that car. Just the way they did it. And the way they came up with solutions at the time. Today you have a CNC machine, you, you can pretty much produce any kind of bolt you need yeah. and any kind of setting you want, you know, mm -hmm. with different kind of machine like that. Back then you actually had to find the part or make it by hand. I remember, you know, looking at stories about Lotus and how they were sourcing parts of it from whatever they could find at yes. the time because they were trying to build something but they weren't sure what what it took. So that's, to me, there is an artistic side to the engineering that used to be done to make the car what they were. 
as simple as that, you know, and, and to push the limit of the car. When you look at the early on racing, you know, with like open, completely open wheel race, a lot of people used to die. Yes. Like a crash, each crash was more or less a fatality. You were in a steel tube and that, that's it. Basically, that's it. Yeah. So with that aspect of racing came really cool engineering that then pour throughout the, you know, the different decades up until you find car. I mean, it's only recently that uh, Bugatti said, we're not going to make a car that's faster because, you know, what, what, where are we going? Yeah. You know, 500 kilometers per hour. Yeah. What's the point? But at some point, it's, it's, you can't even drive them. It's just, we did it and we're good with it. Yeah, and again, in, going back to the 50s and 60s, they were breaking all the barriers, right? They started turbocharging later on, they started coming up. So that was the, the peak of ingenuity that was coming up. Now, of course, the mission is how do we make it more efficient? How do we make it more aerodynamic? How do we save gas? How do we. Those are all the practical sides. Whereas in the, in the old days, it wasn't about being practical, it's who can get out there and, and, and basically change the, the world as a record. And uh, you'll see that in today's cars. And so, again, just to, from, a, from a collection point of view, you know, if you ask me, what kind of things inspire me? Why do I collect certain cars? Or what cars excite me? I would like to say if, if you could purchase, in my opinion, the supercar of each generation. So come, you know, the 300 SL Dulling is, is the supercar of the 50s. Uh, the Lamborghini Mira, um, which I have under restoration, is a supercar of the 60s. Uh, you know, maybe in the 70s, uh, you can argue different cars. But what about, where would you place a Shelby Cobra? Of yeah, so I'm, I'm not super well versed um, in the Cobra world, but that was groundbreaking because that thing won so many races yeah. and it was basically a, a big engine in a small car and it was just a, basically a truck <laughs> in a bottle. So uh, that's, I mean, but, but that developed a lot of what came after, right? I mean, of course, Shelby's. Uh, excitement with the GT40. I think that a lot of that transpired into the yeah. GT40 as it came back and the racing division that he developed. So, you told me earlier the story of your first, what we call, big car. Mm -hmm. well, it was an MP, you said, I think? Yeah, that, that's a different story. That's, that's more of a, a daily driver. And, it, and exactly, that was my first car that, you know, I, I've always had, you know, very basic cars. And finally, I, I was online on Auto Trader every night, every night, every night, and looking at every car in the United States and Canada. I found the car, like you, got it inspected. I physically went and I rubbed my hand on it because I can tell when the car, by hand, where it's been painted. And I found where there was paint because they didn't properly clear coat, and I knew it felt rough. And I said, This fender's been painted. I found out, which the inspecting guy didn't even figure out. Anyway, despite all the negative things, I still, I had already fallen in love with it. And by the way, when it comes to car buying, within about five minutes, if someone comes and looks at one of my cars and says, you know, within five minutes, I already know he either wants it or not. Because once you fall in love, it's over. No matter what the price is, no matter what, it, you cannot get out. I know it and I, I've been in that trap. I mean, you try yeah. to pretend that, you know what, yeah, you want to negotiate, but deep down inside, you like, name okay. the price, I gotta have it. Yes. And, it's, terrible. Uh, it's a terrible feeling when you're trying to negotiate and you're like, it you're just smiling. You're just smiling, you're like, yeah, I'm <laughs> trying to take it down, but you can't. So yeah, so we bought the M3, it was in Toronto, it was a US car, it was imported, it was white with cinnamon interior, SMG, um, and, and it was a convertible, and basically I had to put three car seats in it, because my kids were all in car seats, totally illegal to put a car seat in the front seat, because there's no airbag, yeah. but I was like, okay. hey, Cars gotta go, and uh, and then I bought it and I drove it back, and it was the most amazing feeling driving the car back from Toronto. The steering wheel is a little thicker on the M3. I've never had that. I've always had these puny steering wheels, like a GTR. It's thick. I never had that. Like, oh it's cushiony. God, it's, it's nice. cushiony. I felt it's like a race you car driver. And I drove back and I said, I'm never gonna sell that car. And just to go to that point we talked about earlier, that feeling I got with it, it was twenty six thousand dollars I paid for that car. Yeah. That was the greatest enjoyment I had. And now, you know, we talk about million dollar cars, and yes, they have a fantastic enjoyment, but that early on being so naive and so new, that early first experiences that you get, 
you may never ever repeat that. And that's when I come back, you ask me, you know, what am I looking to do today? Is I want to have experiences. You know, I, I want to buy a car that I can build a connection to that I could drive. Because driving the car makes you connected to the car and brings that a feeling back again. And if you just have a car and it sits there and it doesn't do anything, I'll give you an example, the F40 is a beautiful car to look at, it's gorgeous, we drive it once in a while, but it's not the car that I'm going to go to Montreal with. So it, it, it serves a different purpose. Yeah. Um, yeah. But certainly you need a mixture of both. And, and this is why for me the GTR was the first one, because I literally went from the Altima to the GTR. <laughs> you know, it's like, That's whoa! A big change in the Nissan. If you have a car that you love, you know, and it's quote unquote a regular, you know, or even modified car, I'm like, it, it's about what we love. And what we love is cars and it's, you know, driving them and doing different things to them and making sure they're pretty, whatever that means between, you know, old school collector to someone that do tune-ups, you know, some people for them it's all about tuning the car and modifying the cars and you can see really people think about it and, you know, focus on it. And for me it's very interesting that in the, even in the car world, you can have people that have their focus on different aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And not everybody focus on the same thing. And for me, it's really cool because you, you have people from all over that can have, you know, million dollar car or twenty thousand dollar car and they just can speak about something that's common to them. And yeah. right now in the world, I have to say there is a lot of tension in general. Mm -hmm. And I find that being able to just meet people and speak about something that is just something that we share and love is a really good change. You know, not speaking about politics, not speaking about health, not speaking about all the nonsense. Just, what's your car? Why do you like it? What was your first? And like, just simple stuff, but it's very human to human and sharing that. So. Yeah, well, like you said, the cars bring people together. It's a piece of metal that joins two people. Yeah. You know, that's how I see it. And, and it's international across different races and financial barriers. It breaks all the barriers as far as I'm concerned. And, and you're right, like I, we had a car event here, we did a, a charity for mental health and we had about 250 cars, I had Austin Martin Montreal, I had Mercedes Benz, everybody. And this guy who just actually knocked on the door, I met him at a coffee shop and he has like a Ford Cantina or something, I don't even know, like some, you know, 70s yellow, poor, everything was all ripped and stuff and he goes, do you think I can come to your event? I said, of course you could. So he comes into the event and they stop him at the front because they had people, you know, controlling how many cars come in. They said, no, no, you can't come in because of your car. And I ran into the front. I said, no, 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 no. Everybody's allowed. I don't care if you have a Honda Civic or this guy. And now you see he knocked on the door because he's a friend of mine. And I treated him like the guy with the Aston Martin. And that's what I love about cars is that we're all equal on the same platform. And then you make friends that way, and and you know it's like it's almost like a dog, you know, unconditional love. <laughs> that's where it's, you know it's, it's, there's no strings attached, unconditional. People come together, so that's what I love. Excellent. Anything else you want to talk about? Next car. Next, next time you come in, we'll have the unveiling of something really, really special. Okay. In about a month's time, and maybe okay. that we can do. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Sounds good. Excellent. All right, man. Thank you so much. <laughs>